This is the Friday, May 22, 2020 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now, Sue Martin. Hello, Sue. Hi there. You know, I've been talking, and I said this to Fitz a couple weeks ago, just to a computer screen. So it's good to have, and we're starting to slowly get back into that human interaction. You're yeah. making the trip down today along I-35, and you're used to seeing traffic on busy holiday weekends. Yes. Was it any, did it compare at all? This it week? compared very well. So what does that mean? Are we feeling like we're, this is coming to an end, we're itching to go, we're ready to drive, we're buying all this analyst business of, well, you know, if we start driving again, that's just going to... Did you look at that going, well, this is going to be a good story for corn? Well, it's helping corn because ethanol, you know, lost its luster because of um, the fact that we were going to have such huge supplies of gasoline and gasoline was dropping because nobody was driving and and so it competed against ethanol and pretty soon plants aren't making money and they shut down. Now they're coming back up online. In fact, some of the larger ones have been coming back up online for the past two weeks. So that is a plus and that's helped the cause here a little bit. And of course, ethanol on the charts looks similar like everything else. And it's been oversold and it's starting to come around, met up its uh, lower Bollinger Band, and now we're starting to curve away from it on the weekly charts. But the one thing I will say in corn is that, and energy is, the concern is these global uh, imports. You know, for example, the largest uh, exporter of energy um, LNG, for example, out of the U.S. had 30 uh, uh, loads canceled overnight. And um, that was a big surprise. That came out of China. Mm -hmm. um, you know, China is seeing their economy slow for the first time in, what, 20 years or whatever? In fact, they didn't even make a projection for GDP, which That's is something exactly they haven't done right. in 20, 25 years. That's right. They were very, they're very concerned about their economy. And so that shows. And then Germany... Um, their imports dropped dramatically uh, for the month of March and, and into April. And you look at Japan, and I think they were down this past month for 27%. So, you know, it is having an impact because factories aren't running. Mm -hmm. People have been starting to get to drive, but it's a big thing about the factories more than anything. Well, these factories apparently are making products that we're using in our loungewear, whether it's jogging pants, hoodies, leggings, home comforts. Some but of that's cotton, cotton, but it's not. So, yeah, but what's synthetics. bumping cotton market? Well, I think part of it is the weather. You know, the Delta has been having an awful lot of rain and even forecast again to be catching more over the next seven, ten days. And so I think that's part of it. Um, the other thing is, is that, of course, you know, when we look at cotton and I look at the charts, I think up front, if I looked at the July contract, for example, I would have to say, you get up around 61, I probably would be doing some hedging. Okay. All right, dairy market. That's another one that has gone up and up finally yes. on the class three side. It's a little too late for some. Yes. But is this going to be enough? I mean, as we were talking about in the break between the broadcast and plus here, we were still dumping milk on the ground in the end of March. So yes. why this rally? Well, I think for one thing, dumping has taken away supplies that the consumer could have. In the meantime, you also look at milk and you're seeing a contraction in uh, production via uh, producers getting rid of cows. They're culling their herds. Um, you're even not seeing as much in the way of holding back heifers for breeding. And so I think that what we're seeing here is we're just seeing a contraction, and I think that's helped. And then as people get going to the grocery store, able to start getting out more and more, you're starting to see a bigger pickup in demand for, for milk as well. We can use it in cooking. Yeah, we do all sorts of things at our house with it. Uh, I want to start asking some of the great questions that have come in. We appreciate everyone that comes in via Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Nathan in Inwood, Iowa, up in the northwest part, he's asking, how has the supply and demand fundamentals been impacted by COVID? What is the long-term market cycles tell us and set us up for in the last half of 2020? Is there, Sue, a long-term bear market, is it finally on its last leg? Well, I think for this year, yes. I think we are, uh, because first off, the president has already said he will not shut down this time if COVID breaks out again. 
and I don't think he will. Um, but what I do think is that when we look at um, the cycles, you know, for example, I look at years in similar numbers, and my data goes back, you know, 100 years or more, and corn, for example, tends to, in a year of a zero, many times you will be more traditional and lift up into the June, July period and then slip back. But I have felt all along this was a year very similar to 2010. It was the only year out of the last 10 that ended in a zero where we put our highs in in the first week of January and our lows came in June. And I think that's what we're doing. And then the last half of the year ended up being more positively construed. I think especially, let's look at corn for a second with the weather. First off, we seem to be catching rain, especially in the eastern corn belt, pretty easily. And they've already were saturated, so it didn't take much rain, to, even though they caught a fair amount, to have flooding. But here's the deal. They, the forecast now is calling for more rain. And originally, my sources were talking heat in June, above normal temps, maybe turning a little dry, and being that way on into about July 15th. Now it's changed. Warmer temps, but nothing special, and moisture. Well, it's jungle weather. And you know what that says? It says those risk systems aren't going to go yeah. down. Now you get into July, and all of a sudden we start picking up heat and more drier patterns. And we stay that way through the rest of the summer. What do you think it's going to do to the corn? Shallow roots, it's going to hit the yields. Can't, can't handle any of that heat. Uh, and we had a whole bunch of photos. I was going to show them here from the Facebook page. But uh, great comments from everybody from Illinois, Indiana. Oh, yeah. Excuse me, Wisconsin, wherever. Just saying it's wet, it's dry. I mean, it's just, yes. it doesn't take long. There's an old corn crop question here from Scott in Indiana. And I need to discuss this because we just kind of glossed over a little bit. The president this week put out a 16, the details of the $16 billion plan yes. to help producers. And, and Scott's asking, if we get the 32 cents a bushel of government help on old corn, will the market take that same value provided to the producer away, offsetting any financial gain? There's always conspiracy theorists out there. <laughs> Well, I will say this. The one fear that that is out there is that farmers will take that money, use it to take care of bills in June after planting, and hold on to the old crop corn. And if you have people driving, you're going to have, you know, ethanol plants wanting supplies. They'll have to bid for it to get it. And that'll be the good side. But the deal was People probably hung on a little longer than they maybe should have anyway, but I think that um, you're going to get some demand picking up with the ethanol plants as we move through summer, and that's going to be, it's not going to be like under a normal situation, but certainly it's all about psychology. Markets are the future, and psychology plays a big part in that. So I think that uh, when we look at it, I think your basis levels, one, probably will narrow a little bit. Mm -hmm. But if they're going to narrow for new crop corn, it's going to come after we get past the 4th of July. And then when we, if our forecasts are right, that they turn hot and dry, it's not going to happen just right away. Right. But by the time you're hitting August, bean month, well, then you're all of a sudden you're going to be looking at, gee, this corn doesn't look so special. And you'll be hearing it, especially out of the eastern corn belt and maybe even in the north. And that's something we've heard is that we're, we're, we just need some type of weather. At first, we thought maybe it was going to be dry. Maybe it'll be the wet and hot problem. I want to go to a question now about energy and fertilizer. You kind of perked up when I started talking about this. Shane in Bloomfield, Nebraska was asking, should farmers be locking in 2021 and fall 2020 energy and fertilizer? And what's the best way to do that right now? Well, I think you do. The, um, usually under a normal situation, the best time to lock in energy and fertilizer is in the month of July. But um, this year, with having had the hard break that we've had, and of course, uh, clearing firms were quick to jump on the gun and say, after we all realized something could happen that we never dreamed, um, they started telling people, if you're in the, the June contract of, of crude, you can only get out. You cannot you know, add to your position. And the same way was with options. Now, they've kind of started to relent with the July contract. So we're not going to see the situation, because they were proactive, we're not going to see it probably happen in the... Uh, Go negative, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. 
but we could get a little pullback here off of the fact that we're starting to see some some uh, cancellations, for example, by China, like we've seen. You could start to see a little hint of a pullback, but uh, the market rallied quite a bit off of that minus price. And in the meantime, I would say first go to your supplier and that you use and see where he's at, how you can work that. If you can't, then I would say, and options are so expensive uh, to buy, but that'd be your best bet is to buy an option. Try to do it somewhat fairly close to the money, even though you're going to pay more. Um, and especially give yourself some time. Okay. But we're driving. Things are picking back up. The president has said he's not going to shut down, even if. So the next key will be how well does the media scare the socks out of everyone that they start staying home again? I don't know. I don't know if that'll happen where people will really stay home. We'll see. All right, last thing. I've got two things I really want to talk about. One I'm going to probably have to put to a rainy day, but this one's about India. Uh, they had a report today about African swine fever, hogs. They had uh, 10, almost 11,000 sick, deaths around 3,700. That's about a 9 million population of hog market. We talked a little bit about uh, some of these other markets. So, so if you have a hog problem in India, uh, they already kind of had their coronavirus round. Uh, rice has become a hot commodity. Wheat's filled in some of those things. Is this the kindling to a fire that could, I think you said earlier, like an explosion of some kind? Yes. The, the one thing we have to keep in mind is the uh, desert locusts are on the move. In fact, there are swarms in eastern Africa that are as large as some of the major cities. That's hard to believe. And right now, the latest number I've gotten is about 33 million people are at risk of losing food. And so you look at rice maybe first, that's usually an easy thing to get into them, but then it's the wheat crops. And here's the thing, you just seen a major uh, cyclone go into India and part of, uh, I believe, Pakistan. And the thing is, desert locusts thrive on breeding in very wet conditions. And unfortunately, Mother Nature seems to be gratifying that. So that is something that I think we need to be watching as we start to see this, these food supplies shrink even further globally and the demand for rice. You know, you've got Ethiopia, uh, Somalia, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of all of them. Uh, there's like five countries in East Africa, you know, that have got an issue. And then you're looking at India, Pakistan, and you have a, the world's second largest population in India that rely on rice, wheat, and then, of course, they raise soybeans, too. It's, a, it's a global story that we always have to be is, following. It is. It right. is. Our global supplies are going to continue to shrink, I believe. Okay. Sue Martin, good to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. That's Sue Martin. And uh, we appreciate her for coming in and giving us her insight. Next week, we'll be back at the uh, story table to examine the supply lines that, and I see how they're handling the reopening of the country. And Angie Setzer will join us to analyze these markets. I'm Paul Yeager. Thank you so very much for watching, listening, or reading here on Market Plus. Have a pleasant day.